Good evening, everyone. We like to start, you know, on time. This is one of the characteristics of this particular lecture series. So it's 1900, and at the outset, let me welcome all of you on behalf of the India Habitat Center and the Society for Policy Studies for this particular lecture series. Before I move any further, let me repeat what I said earlier. Please put your phones on silent or on flight mode. And we also, this is not breaking news, so unless you are compulsive, one of the you know, objectives of the Changing Asia series is to encourage our participants and members to say that there is life without a cell phone. So for about 60 to 70 minutes, you can keep your phone in whichever mode you want. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to tweet. You don't have to tell the rest of the world about what the speaker is saying. So this is only a request and a suggestion. But if you are, you know, if the world needs you, then look at your phone, but do it unobtrusively. Because if you are noticed by the chair, there are penalties to pay. But I'm kidding. I have no penalties to pay. But again, let me welcome all of you on behalf of the Habitat and the SPS to this Changing Asia series. I'm delighted to see the mix of the audience today. Some of you, of course, have been here in the past. I do want to acknowledge the presence of a number of people here who have, I think, in different ways contributed to both public policy and public discourse in India. You know, large number of people. This is not a question of seniority, but I do want to recognize Ambassador Sham Saran, who has been our foreign secretary and the prime minister's envoy and held various positions. I want to recognize our former chief election commissioner, Mr. Brahma, who again is a man of you know, great eminence but extreme modesty. Admiral Koshua, former commandant of the National Defense College, Mr. Ravi Bhutalingam, Ambassador Suresh Goel, you know, various other people who, as I said, over the years have done their bit by the country and the public discourse that we try to encourage. I also want to recognize our younger members. You know, we send out a number of invites through social media. And I'm delighted to have Melbourne, you know, students from Melbourne who have seen this on social media and from other parts of uh, the university and college system in India. We have some representatives from diplomatic missions and the foreign media. I'm delighted. But that, of course, I must add in parenthesis is because of the speaker. Ms. Haider, as most of you are aware, Suhasini Haider is the diplomatic editor of The Hindu. And before that, she has had a very, I would say, illustrious and distinguished career in television journalism. For a long time, she was the face of CNN IBN. She was the prime time anchor. That's when I first saw her and heard her. And, you know, I know that many of us said that she brings an enormous amount of depth to both her comments when she was in television and now when she writes for the Hindu. So we made this request on behalf of the Habitat and the SPS to be part of this particular series. And despite her commitments, she landed in town by a delayed flight at 3.30 PM today, sent out her text, which she would promised to send me. And she's here. You know, As I said, it's a remarkable sort of commitment to whatever she has undertaken. And this particular subject that we've chosen, you know, the Trump effect, challenges and opportunities for Asia, fits into the larger series, the Changing Asia series that we had started about three years ago. And various aspects of the flux in Asia, you know, on different aspects. This particular series is not just about security, strategic studies, or international relations. We've tried to cover it. We've tried to cover different facets through the speakers that we have invited over the last three years. And this seemed particularly appropriate at the end of 2018. That ever since President Donald Trump occupied the White House. There are a couple of characteristics or words that have been used repeatedly to describe this presidency over the last couple of years. There is Trump, and there is what you might call as turbulence. There is Trump, and there is uncertainty. There is Trump, and there is petulance. And finally, there is Trump and the tweet with the capital T. Now, these are just some of the ways of, shall we say, describing the President of the United States. But like in all democracies, the citizens of that country have elected Mr. Donald Trump to be the President of the United States. So he remains the POTUS, the President of the United States. And, you know, as in all democracies, we in India are aware of our own, shall we say, experience. 
that while the elected representative gets elected on a certain plank, in Mr. Trump's case, he had been elected on the Republican plank. Within the Republican Party, he represents a certain constituency. But after taking the oath, he becomes the President of the United States. So there is a certain synergy between the cross of democracy, where you are elected on a certain plank. But once you take oath, you also assume responsibility for the country at large. In similar fashion, as I said, we in India have had our own experience when we had Mr. Modi becoming the Prime Minister, elected on a certain plank, but he is the Prime Minister of India. And how democracy plays out invariably is turbulent, sometimes, shall we say, not so savory. But we will try and examine and review the last two years. Ms. Haider would speak to us about this and try and disaggregate the implications for Asia as a continent, we are aware, even as we speak, that we have a very anomalous situation where this afternoon on the news sticker, I saw a little sort of thing streaking past, saying that senior US advisor proposes that China should be expelled from the WTO. Now, that's big news. I mean, if China is being expelled from the WTO. But just a few days ago, there was also a talk saying that maybe the United States might try to distance itself from the WTO. So this is like Alice in Wonderland. You know, we are not quite sure as to where globalization is headed, but that is only one example. But we are aware that in Jan 2017, when President Trump occupied the White House, he came with certain promises. President Trump came to the White House with certain promises. And one of them was he said that he is going to walk out of the TPP because he felt it was a bad deal. A lot of us, I remember going public at that time, writing, saying that it's very unlikely that he'll do it. There's too much at stake, etc. And bingo, the next thing you know, there was a tweet. We are out of TPP. <laughs> Similarly, on Iran, we presumed that there was too much at stake in terms of global and regional strategic stability and that the Obama-led Iran deal would remain intact. But again, that was something that President Trump took a decision. Now, this is only one aspect. But at the same time, there are people who are trying to read between the tea leaves, and there are supporters of President Trump's turbulence and what he has done, the way he has literally, you know, shooken up the global system. A recent issue of The Economist, for instance, has a fairly positive assessment of the long-term impact of President Trump on the global system. So it's not as binary as, you know, is being made out to be. And we couldn't have a better person than Ms. Suhasini Haider to walk us through this particular, shall we say, aspect of more recent global developments. And as I said, she is currently with the Hindu. Prior to that, she was here in IBN. I was about to read two pages of a very rich CV. But Suhasini just told me that please don't do that and embarrass me. So I said, fine, I won't embarrass it, but I'll put it up on the website. So along with the text of her lecture, very soon, both her CV and the text will be up on both the websites, the Habitat and the SPS. And on that note, let me thank all of you once again. And my last request, we are trying very hard to sort of, you know, build this gravitas to the public lecture. So she'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes. My request to you is please do not leave unless it's a dire emergency till the talk is over. A public lecture needs, as I said, a certain audience participation. And we'll have the first shuffle closer to 8 o'clock. I know some of you have dinner commitments. And then we'll continue with the QA. I hope that's acceptable to all of you. On that note, Ms. Haider, may I, ma'am, request you? Please. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Commander Bhaskar. You've been. Uh, uh, somebody that uh, has inspired me for many more years than you know, because I have interviewed you since uh, the days I was at CNN uh, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, thank you very much to the India Habitat Center and the Society for Policy Studies. Um, I should put the disclaimer right up top that when I speak about the Trump effect, it would probably be a good idea to have somebody come and speak about the she effect uh, so that it doesn't seem as if, uh, you know, I'm just uh, sort of taking on only one problem in the world. But we are going to try and, you know, 
take apart some of the strands. So thank you very much for joining me this evening uh, as we try to gauge the effect of US policies since the advent of the Trump administration on the world and on Asia in particular. I'm from a very, very, very old school of uh, thinking on foreign policy, so I'm, uh, I'm very uncomfortable with personalizing foreign policy. But I do recognize that this is the order of the day, and not just in India or in the United States, but around the world. Um, in the past, the sense has really been that regardless of a change in US administration, policy continuity is more or less maintained. We were always told it really doesn't matter at the end, you know, uh, you have uh, the people in uh, the Department of Defense and the uh, State Department that will run things. Um, on policies like the treatment of allies like NATO, trade policies, honoring deals made by uh, previous administrations. It is normally in that transition period of a government uh, th in the US that ensures that a singular vision prevails. It explains you know, simple things like why Obama didn't eventually shut down Guantanamo, uh, or Bush continued Clinton's economic policies, or why securing the liberal international order, these are words that are used constantly since the 1940s, remained a US objective since the war. And the furtherance of what is known as Pax Americana uh, really was that objective. The last two years have, however, made us reconsider this particular precept. Mr. Trump has, in fact, turned the precept on its head, beginning with his transition period where, as we know, um, very few people really knew what was happening and no handover seemed very possible. Pax Americana and certainly the desire for a liberal international rules-based order is no longer a given objective. There may be a little lip service to it, but I see that term actually no longer meaning what it used to. I want to clarify here that the meaning of the Trump effect is not some personalized vilification of the US president, as I said. I will use the word Trump effect a lot. I will, use the, uh, I will name Mr. Trump a lot. What I really mean is what is now being seen quite seriously by scholars as the study of a set of new policies in the United States that have been brought to bear by the Trump administration, i.e. since tw January 2017. If you go, for example, to the Reuters website or you go to the Nikkei Asian Review, you will actually find whole sections dedicated to tracking the Trump effect. Uh, and essentially what they're doing is tracking the effect on domestic and international and trade policies. So this is a subject uh, now, a new subject, you may, we have students over here, you may soon have courses in the subject as well. So if you think I'm being overly dramatic, I'm going to paint the landscape for you. And count the ways in which the US has unilaterally changed the landscape, because this makes a difference. You know, there are a lot of changes that happen in countries' foreign policies, which are dictated by the outside world. There are others that are completely unilaterally done. To begin with, this is something we are all aware of, and, uh, and you spoke about the, uh, 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 the, the Twitter handle. Um, on his Twitter handle, in public commentary, Mr. Trump has had open public fights with many, if not most, of the US's closest allies. We're not even getting into North Korea and whose button is bigger than the other. Um, but NATO, Canada, Australia, he has told Japan and South Korea to pay their share more imposed tariffs on allies and neighbors alike. His administration has reversed immigration policies entirely, whether they are for refugees, immigrants, illegal immigrants, H-1B visa holders, and their spouses, as we know here in India. Then there have been the walkouts that Commander Uday Bhaskar spoke about from international agreements and regimes. In the past two years, and let me count the ways, the US has exited from UNESCO, and from the UN Human Rights Council, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and has threatened to walk out of the World Trade Organization as well. It has walked out of two key international multilateral agreements, the JCPOA with Iran uh, on, on nuclear issues and the Paris Climate Change Agreement. In fact, on the environment, studies showed that the Trump administration has changed as many as 70 laws internally in the United States which is the largest chunk out of roughly 200 laws that have been changed through executive orders and legislative actions in the first year of his administration. Above all, 
And, you know, there was, there was this idea that we look at the embraces of our leaders, but actually we have to start looking at the spaces that they leave behind. There's been the removal or reduction of the U.S. presence from many theaters of action, creating space for regional players. And we can discuss this later in the questions if you like. But he has essentially, by his actions, left Syria open for Iran and its allies. He seems to be leaving Afghanistan to Russia. Yemen to Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan to China. 2018 has also been a year of high drama on the trade front, with sanctions and tariffs being proposed against a slew of countries, and a full-blown trade war with China, with tariffs on goods worth more than $200 billion. Not all of these moves have been unpopular worldwide, so <clears throat> if I sound like what I'm saying is very disapproving, the fact is that many of us here in India are quite happy with the tough talking Mr. Trump is giving China, um, given Chinese trade practices in the past, um, and also have little complaint with the US decision to cut military funding uh, to Pakistan, including what we saw uh, being cut today. But in the larger scheme, they bolster the trend. Pax Americana may not yet be in retreat, but it certainly has fallen into a pattern of walkouts. In the past two years, and even in his campaign, Mr. Trump's doctrine was clear. So if we are, we have to. We can't keep assuming that somebody wakes up in the morning and tweets. We have to work off a base. Where does Mr. Trump come from? The elements of his doctrine included an America first in trade and foreign policy. Where do we see that today? Just two days ago, uh, yesterday in fact, in a statement where he explained why the US would stand by Saudi Arabia this is what Mr. Trump said. As President of the United States, I intend to ensure that in a very dangerous world, America is pursuing its national interests and vigorously contesting countries that wish to do us harm. Very simply, it's called America first. Now, when he came in, maybe America first just meant trade, protectionism, anti-immigration, and all the rest. But we are getting a sense and certainly getting a taste of the fact that America first for Mr. Trump also means that in the foreign policy sphere, they will not be looking really at, um, uh, at, you know, they will be looking at their interests alone. Would some of you like to come in front? There are at least two or three chairs. Um, in terms of style, you know, um, beyond the substance of this America First doctrine, there was also the particular methods, uh, right? There would be the idea that um, allies must step up and contribute resources, something Mr. Trump spoke about. America's enemies are on notice. He has said this to North Korea first before uh, talks with them, said this to Iran, certainly said this to Pakistan. Um, and that US would meet threats with power and demand a reciprocity in trade. But there is one particular method that sounded very familiar to some who had been following US foreign policy of the past. Um, and that was called the madman theory. In fact, Richard Nixon is once famously supposed to have told H.R. Haldeman, who was his chief of staff in 1968-69, and Haldeman wrote this in his memoirs. I call it the madman theory, Bob, said Nixon. I want the North Vietnamese to believe I've reached the point where I might do anything to stop the war. We'll just slip the word to them that, for God's sake, you know, Nixon is obsessed with communism. He, we can't restrain him when he's angry, and he has his hand on the nuclear button. And Nixon said, Ho Chi Minh himself will be in Paris in two days begging for peace. So that does sound a little familiar, the idea that the leader is so crazy that we better do whatever he wants because we can't control him. In fact, um, when I was speaking to a colleague about this, he said, yes, Trump is definitely Nixon with a Twitter handle. Um, to be fair, though, the Trump doctrine is a little closer to another US common acronym called W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G, what you see is what you get. And that is possibly a cause for greater worry. What are the challenges then that are posed by this doctrine to the world? How must we prepare for them? And are there opportunities we can harness here in India and in our wider region in Asia? So let's begin with India and where the challenges lie for us and then broaden the theater. Some of what I say now may be contentious. I speak uh, uh, in, in many roles, but I do speak in my capacity as a journalist. Uh, so if I speak about sources and leaks, please do forgive me. 
In February this year, the phone rang at the White House. Prime Minister Narendra Modi was on the line to President Donald Trump. The call was unscheduled and in fact, even to this day, the Ministry of External Affairs has never put out its version of what was discussed. At the time, the White House said that the two leaders spoke about events in the Maldives. And everyone was a bit puzzled about what Mr. Trump and Mr. Modi were actually going to say. A few days later, however, Mr. Trump came out with some details of the call. He said on camera that Prime Minister Modi had telephoned him to tell him that he was bringing the tariffs on Harley-Davidson motorcycles, which was a sore point in the relationship, down further. Last year, the government had brought the tariffs down from 100 to 75 percent. Now, in a notification that was sent out a few days after the phone call, India was prepared to bring them down from 75 percent to 50 percent. Here's how Trump reacted, and this is all on camera. He said, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, referring to Mr. Modi, who I think is a fantastic man, called me the other day, Mr. Trump said, and said, we are lowering it to 50%. I said, okay, but so far we're getting nothing. So we get nothing, he gets 50, and they think we're doing, like they're doing us a favor. For most of us in India, the Trump statement merited a rolling of the eyes. There were those who chose to focus, and I just go by media reports on that conversation, on the negativity in what Mr. Trump said. Do the Indians think they're doing us a favor? Clearly, a bit offensive to some of us. There were others who said, well, at least Mr. Trump called Prime Minister Modi a fantastic man and a great friend. But very few focused on the unsaid signals of what Mr. Trump was saying. And as we know now, there are very few things that Mr. Trump says just off the bat of his hand. There are things that he's thinking about, regardless of whether they, we feel they're rational or logical. The first unsaid signal was that trade is an issue that means a lot, in which accommodating the United States will reap disproportionate benefits, but the opposite will wreak wreck disproportionate anger. The second, that India or any other country must not take their special status with the US for granted. And the third, that Mr. Trump is not a traditional interlocutor, and this is important. You may think you are having a private conversation with him, but the niceties of keeping the conversation private on his side are dispensed with. So be prepared to say only that which can be publicly revealed, and don't make promises in private that you won't keep publicly. There's something else that has received very little focus. That conversation on February 8th this year, which is nine months ago and more, was the last time the two men spoke, according to officials both in Delhi and Washington. The last time they met was more than a year ago in Manila on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit. Compare this to the regular conversations between Mr. Bush and Dr. Singh, or Dr. Singh and Mr. Obama, or Mr. Modi and Mr. Obama. Mr. Modi and Mr. Obama, uh, by the way, just in two years between September 2014 and 2016, met eight times in different parts of the globe and spoke on the telephone about a dozen times. Mr. Trump and Mr. Modi, in comparison, met twice last year and will possibly meet for the first time this year at the G20 on November the 30th. This is not to negate the close interactions that we have seen at other levels, both in Washington, the 2 plus 2 ministerial level meeting in Delhi, as well as the Modi-Pence meeting in Singapore last week. But in a relationship that has been driven for the past two decades by the relationship between Indian and American leaders, this is as significant an indi indicator as any other that gaps in ties, regardless of their origin, must be addressed. So what are the gaps? What is the impact, or as I said, the Trump effect of US policy in the past two years? To begin with, there is the economic impact. In the past year, India has faced tariffs on a wide range of goods, we all know this. Not, of course, close to what China has faced, but significant nonetheless. There's been a surge in disputes between the two countries on the US decision to put on review India's GSP export status, the proposed cuts in H-1B professional visas, cancellation of H-4 spouse visas, India's tariffs and resistance to US exports of dairy and pork products, on Indian price reductions on medical devices, we know this is something that upset Washington a lot, and of course the Reserve Bank of India rules on data localization. That sounds like a lot of things to worry about. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump has called India a tariff king and used the terms freeloader that piggybacks on other economies. <coughs> India's response is still awaited, but the impact on the trade is already becoming clear. And we can always speak about this in the wider region. And if we speak about Asia, the trade war with China is the overhanging dilemma.
In July, of course, the U.S. imposed those tariffs on $250 billion uh, of Chinese imports to force concessions from Beijing on the list of demands that would change the terms of trade between the two countries. It's essentially a remake of maybe how he dealt with North Korea as well, but on a much larger and perhaps a little more sophisticated level. China has responded with import tariffs on US goods, and many countries in the region will feel the ancillary impact given their ties with China and dependence on its manufacturing supply chain. And countries uh, have already expressed their worry about this. Let's remember that the United States exports nearly $700 billion in goods and services to the Indo-Pacific, which increased 47% over the past decade. So when people say that globalization uh, is essentially the problem. Uh, certainly, it's not been a problem for the United States. According to a report, the United States exports more to the Indo-Pacific than to Canada and Mexico combined. Five of the United States' top 10 bilateral trading partners are also in the Indo-Pacific, China, Japan, Korea, India, and Taiwan. As you can see, the U.S. will also stand to lose from a prolonged trade war, but smaller economies in Asia will be the hardest hit. Next, let's turn to the strategic impact or the strategic Trump effect. In the two geostrategic uh, policies unveiled by President Trump in the past year, India plays an important stated role. The first is the US's Indo-Pacific policy. In fact, we know that they changed their, uh, um, uh, their command to reflect the Indian name. Of course, the fact was that it reflected the Indian Ocean, uh, perhaps a little more than just India. It is still unclear what each side will actually do for the other. When it comes to connectivity projects in the region that will help India counter China, there is no movement on joint projects of the kind that we have seen, nascent projects, little ones between India and Japan. On the other side, maritime security. India has ruled out being part of patrols in anything other than neighboring waters with any third parties. While these are promising areas of cooperation, Indo-US cooperation, particularly with the signing of the LEMOA and SISMOA agreements to coordinate between militaries, it really remains to be seen how far they will go together and how soon, given the Trump effect. Because the Trump effect, in a sense, is both forging this kind of really purposeful and decisive uh, uh, dialogue, but it is also leaving a lot of cause for worry. So, India is not the only country that is hedging its bets in a certain sense. If the U.S. eventually seeks to pull out of Afghanistan, as Mr. Trump is understood to have said he wants to do, where does that leave India, which is not prepared to put boots on the ground there? If India won't allow Malabar exercises to be convened for the quadrilateral with India, U.S., Japan, and Australia together, is there a clarity of purpose in the Indo-Pacific itself? There's even a divergence on the geographical boundaries of the Indo-Pacific region, if you notice, um, it was uh, General Mattis who said that it's the Indo-Pacific region bookended by India and the US, the west coast of the US uh, and India, while for India, it extends all the way to Africa. Some of these cracks will be papered over by the growing defense purchases that India has made from the US, which are really growing every year. But the truth is that transactionalism cannot in the long run overshadow traditional positions. This is something we've even seen with Russia. When we actually wanted to better our ties with Russia, it wasn't just a question of buying more from Russia. It was a question of reviving those traditional positions. In terms of the extra benefits, we come to another impact of the India-US partnership. It has been a mixed bag. While it helps to have the U.S.'s backing on issues like terrorism emanating from Pakistan, the Financial Action Task Force, U.N. groupings, there's a certain opportunity cost in terms of ties with China, which the government has had to address in the last year post the Wuhan summit. So every time we have uh, aligned our positions internationally with the U.S., we have, so for example, the biggest example of that is the Nuclear Suppliers Group. We have faced the largest pushback um, from China. Furthermore, the Trump trade war with China will force choices on us all. And this is what I was saying when I spoke about the choices we have to make. Last week at the ASEAN summit, Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Sin Lung said, if you are friends with two countries, now this is unusual for Singapore to have to say, if you are friends with two countries which are on different sides, sometimes it is possible to get along with both. Sometimes it's more awkward when you try to get along with both. I think it's very desirable for us not to have to take sides, but the circumstances may come when ASEAN may have to choose 
between one or the other. I'm hoping that that time is not coming soon. These are very unusual words for the Singaporean prime minister placed where he is to say. The US is itself doing itself no favors and making those choices easier. Uh, Farid Zakaria pointed out in a recent column when President Trump refuses to travel to two of the three, uh, uh, to the two, three major summits in the region last week. Uh, he sent Vice President Pence, as we know, he met with Prime Minister Modi to attend the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN US meet, and the APEC Summit. Finally, when we're looking at all the various parts of the Trump effect, there is a Trump effect on the most resilient and substantial bond between India and the United States. Substantial is, a, is, a, is a, I understand, a subjective term, but it's something that I believe. And that is of the goodwill that is shared by their people. For most Americans, India is a land of myriad cultures, history, and plurality. For most Indians, America is the land of opportunity and equality. It is not an exaggeration to say that the advent of populism, what we have seen in the last few years around the world, is bringing those values into doubt. All of those values are today in doubt, not just in the US, but in India and around the world. The impact, though, has become most quantifiable, if you like, in the US. It's one thing to say, I feel uncomfortable, or I, you know, there's a xenophobia in the air, but with the US, you are seeing the physical impact, the visas drying up, the walls going up, rules being changed to stop the flow, free flow of people. Joseph Nye, and you know, he is now famous for having really, he didn't coin the term soft power, but he is attached with the term soft power because he has defined it uh, so well. He said that he once asked the Singapore founder, Lee Kuan Yew, whether China would sup surpass the US ever. Would China overtake the US, US? And what Lee said was no. He said because the China has the talents of 1.4 billion people to draw upon. But the openness of the United States allows it to tap and combine the talents of 7.5 billion people with greater creativity than China could. Obviously, you've heard this before. If that openness survives, American leadership in Asia and elsewhere will most likely survive as well. Today, it is that openness itself which is in doubt, as the world watching the Trump administration's immigration bans, H-1B spouse visa curtailment, walls going up, and caravans being stopped. And there is an impact. According to the official annual Open Doors report, that was released here as well last week. In the year ended September 30th, 2017, the State Department issued 17% fewer student visas than in the previous year. 40% fewer than the peak year of 2015. They're actually issuing fewer visas. This is not something that has come out before. India and China with the biggest student intake showed very low increases. Compared to the past, where there was a constant 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, increase, India and China uh, showed intake increases of 3 to 5 percent. The decline in international enrollment is forcing institutions inside the United States to make tough budget cuts as well, which will ultimately impact the U.S.'s resource wealth and research and so many other areas that attract the United States to the, our youth around the world. While the administration says it has only proposed visa cuts, not implemented them, the truth is that the Trump effect is also seen in the polarization of society, the perceived rise in racist attacks within the country. This perception would have to be fought as well, given that according to the East-West Institute that runs the site Asia for America for Asia, it's a very interesting site. Students from the Indo-Pacific contribute more than $25 billion to the US economy. Nearly 68% of international students in the United States are from the Indo-Pacific, are from Asia. Over 730,000 Asian students study in the United States in an academic year, more than twice the number from the rest of the world combined. So this is now an effect that you can see internally as well as ex if, if, externally. Given the broad swathe of concerns with the Trump effect and the setting out of the canvas of challenges, it is imperative that we in India, as well as our near and far neighbors in Asia, consider how we will continue to grow and to secure our futures. It is necessary that the response, as it has been in the past, to China's aggressive growth in the region be calibrated in a much more coordinated way, what the Americans call a joined-up way, 
without earning unnecessary fire from the Trump administration, much as we have done with China, you know, work the balance uh, with the United States in the way that it has been, uh, been done with, with China in some respects. Where possible, the US must be negotiated with and convinced about the detrimental impact of its actions on the world. Where it is impossible to change its course, the US, like China has in many areas, must face a combined and united front. When Washington imposed steel and aluminum tariffs this year, for example, it may have been more productive to have organized a coordinated pushback rather than what we saw, which was each country just going up to the US and negotiating their own waivers uh, by one tactic or another, offering all kinds of incentives. When the US imposed unilateral and unsanctified sanctions, I mean unsanctified by the United Nations on Iran after exiting the JCPOA, the focus of, Indian and West, of India and Western countries has been on negotiating waivers on oil trades negotiating the waiver for the Chabahar port, as well as to build this special purpose vehicle to circumvent the sanctions. So everybody's uh, pushback to the Trump effect has been, how can we get around this? How can we just you know, dig our head de deep in the sand and then just kind of crawl around what is clearly a massive impact around the world? At some point, it will also be necessary for the world to ask Washington, but why? What has Iran done, demonstrably, to deserve these sanctions, for example? If the IAEA certifies Iran's adherence to the JCPOA, which it has done once again just this week, um, then how does one not see the United States' actions, including the new sanctions that were imposed today, as a violation of the international rules-based system? If the US says it doesn't need the United Nations, won't be a member of its organizations, and rejects the multilateralism that has held the world instead since the war ended in 1945, then what is the alternative platform that we are going to be able to achieve? Can unilateralism, transactionalism, and bilateral dealings, which everyone says is the pragmatic way forward, can all of these only lead to anything but trouble for the world in general? And if, as the Trump effect continues, the trouble is inevitable, then is it not more pragmatic to face those challenges, armed with people who share the same principles and values than without? The need of the hour really is a detailed understanding of the Trump effect, studied without perhaps the unfair prism, and I, I, I do want to make that clarification, of anti-Americanism. Speaking about what he called the crisis of the collective system, French President Macron has urged the world not to allow the unraveling of the US, uh, of the rules-based order. He said this, in saying our interests first, whatever happens to the others, you erase the most precious thing a nation can have, that which makes it live, that which causes it to be great, and that which is most important, its moral values. Sounds familiar. At another event, External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj has said, there is a storm of protectionism at the global level which is centered around the concept of me and myself. But India believes in the concept of we, us, and ourselves. If everyone views the other as equal, then there is no place for protectionism in it. My guess, ladies and gentlemen, is we will hear more such lofty words from more corners of the world in the months to come. They must be heeded. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. And I'd be happy to take questions. I'd like to thank Ms. Heather, I think, for a very thoughtful overview of a fairly complex subject. <coughs> but as I promised some of you, if any of you need to sort of uh, exit for whatever other commitments, please feel free to do so. We'll open up for QA now. <coughs> And, you know, it just struck me that one of the issues that we could perhaps take forward in the QA is that today we are, when I say we, I think the global community or the international order at large is trying to cope with two kinds of unilateralism. You know, till recently we had accepted that the United States, as she said, was the leader of the international order, the liberal order, and that was the equivalent which in political science theory IR theory, we talk about the consensual hegemon. You know, Gramsci elaborates at length about this kind of, you know, a profile that is accorded to one country. 
but clearly you know there was anxiety about china becoming unilateral the south china sea is a very good example of chinese unilateralism and the region is trying to cope with that but of course over the last two years we've had mr trump's unilateralism and what these two tracks are doing so as in the past what i'll do is that you know we normally recognize our former speakers you know at all such events and today we have ambassador sham saran who spoke at this platform some time ago and mr ravi bhotalingam if they would like to make any comments at the outset i'd you know, recognize them failing which i'll pass the word and as i said as always please identify yourself and you have the option to make a comment or tell suhasini why you don't agree with her and why trump is good for you know, it's i'm just kidding but you know you have any which way of you know triangulating your questions so sham sir if you want to go first ravi you want to make a comment now i just have a question yeah yeah get the mic here please uh, mic hai kya no. is ravi sir ko dena hai and just identify yourself for purpose of recording uh, good evening i'm ravi bothlingam uh, suhasini another excellent talk as as customary uh, from you uh, one question you mentioned uh, fairly early on in your talk that you uh, are not a believer in personalized foreign policy and you also said that however dramatically president trump is presenting his case and the twitter and all of this that there is a deeper element running behind what he is doing and so my question is that whether trump comes for a second term or even after he comes and goes after his second term um if if there is one do you feel there is a a, a somewhat long term nature to this trump effect in terms of the continuity of these you mentioned the continuity has gone so if trump goes are these going to snap back like a elastic band is you know iran jcp coming back everything else back to normal and we just think this is a dream and get over it or is it going to last thank you thank you uh, i'm sanjeev shivastu i am a researcher on foreign policy issues very insightful talk thank you very much my question is uh, similar to what uh, sir asked that uh, this trump phenomena uh, is it a uh, limited to mr trump till the time he is in office either for two years or another six years or is it a pattern like even after he goes who knows uh, the similar personality follows mr trump in the white house what we have seen b- before mr trump Brexit happened, and now what we are seeing in Brazil that uh, the uh, far right uh, personality uh, has become president of the Brazil. So, is it the phenomena what we are going through? And uh, if that is a phenomena, uh, a pattern, then how are we going to deal with this? Thank you. Um, well, I I do think uh, that the Trump effect is uh, is is a lasting one. I I don't think uh, you can snap back from a lot of policies because essentially Mr Trump um and I think we were just uh, you know discussing this Mr Trump has changed the way a lot of Americans think uh you know this this narrative of being the victim of bad uh, uh trade deals with other countries is something that does resonate inside the United States and they just take a look at their deficits and think you know this is it um but uh but, but but the truth is that he is there because he represents something he is there for better or for worse he is the democratically elected leader of the country that often means that that's something that people wanted um and i as a result i would i would i i, I would think that a lot of the effects that i have spoken about the retrenchment of the united states in strategic spheres um the the complete overturning of uh, international agreements will be difficult to turn around you would have to find someone like the reverse between president olon and and president macron uh to try and even on the face of it make those differences but i don't think you're 
uh, you're going to find somebody being able to uh, come in and, and completely turn things around uh, uh, just yet. Um, uh, the, the truth is that um, a lot of what he has said, and I, I'm sorry if I made it sound any differently, a lot of what he said is believed. It is not just he who is saying it. And uh, let's be fair, let's uh, give him his due. He has managed to bully the world, and he has managed to get people to back off. He has managed to get China to reconsider its position. Uh, this was not thought of about a year ago. Um, he has managed to get most of us to say not, as I said in my talk, that uh, um, not uh, say, no, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing it. Instead, all of us are saying, how can we be spared from your anger, you know? Uh, and, and, and so I, I think that he's going to um, leave a lasting uh, legacy. The place where I think uh, there will be a tilting over of the balance is when the US retrenches so much that it becomes a little less relevant to the world. Um, so you mentioned Brexit, and, and the truth is, what happens next with the United Kingdom? If um, essentially it cuts itself off enough, it will be an island in the Atlantic. And, um, and, and so they have to think about that, but what you said was an important point, and it comes back to this, that Mr. Trump is there, yes, because of a lot of what he says and uh, what, uh, you know, what he was able to convey to voters, but he was also part of a larger phenomenon, which we can't get away from. I would urge you to read a book called uh, What is Populism? It was written before Mr. Trump came to power. It was written before uh, um, uh, the 2014 election here. It was written before uh, um, Brexit really became a reality. And it looked at uh, some of the, the broad themes between what it defined as populist leaders. What were the populist leaders doing? They were appealing to a majoritarianism, but it wasn't to the majority. It was appealing to the minority within the majority that feels uh, in some way deprived, that feels in some way that it has not got its just share. And in each of the cases that we look at with populism, that is what each of the leaders have been able to put their finger on. They've been able to find that consolidated minority within the majority that essentially does that. They've been able to use foreign policy essentially as a tool for domestic policy. I mean, here you have Mr. Trump actually saying that the, the relationship with Saudi Arabia is, is basically about what he needs as a, a country. As a, it's basically because of domestic policy. So, um, uh, I mean, if nothing else, it's at least honest. Uh, you know, can you imagine a prime minister in our country saying essentially I need to be horrible to Pakistan because it's, uh, it works for my domestic policy. Nobody's ever going to say that. But Mr. Trump has, and it's a White House statement. It's not just a tweet that he put out. Uh, my name is Suresh Goel. So, Hasani, you said uh, you don't want to personalize uh, the Trump effect. However, the working style of any uh, prime minister or president does make an impact on the policies. Uh, today, the way Prime Minister Modi functions, there's a lot of personalization of the issues, really. Now, my question is this. Uh, today, practically everyone is in the administration in the USG at the pleasure of Trump. Mike Pence at one time is a loyal colleague. Today he is not. Pompeo says that yes, Saudi Arabia will have to be, to essentially saying pay the price, sanctions, etc., etc. Today after Trump says something different, Pompeo agrees with him. So I think he is not really leaving a team which can build an institution. Against that context, how permanent will be the Trump effect, which is same as Ravi Bhutale was saying. Thank you. you? So, yeah, so Asani, don't you think, uh, yeah, Dr. Sarjit Dudeja, don't you think that uh, USA claims to be a superpower and it lost its superpower status? The way he got elected number one because of Putin is a fraud system. And Hillary was much more popular. First thing, second thing that rec recently, yeah, second thing that recently Trump said we are not a developing rich country. We can't give fund to everyone, so we are also a developing country. Though this is also a count to lose its status. Thank you. Yeah, sure. 
Ooh, okay. So then we'll just do it very quickly. Um, ag agree with you, Ambassador Goel. There, there are going to be all these contradictions in, in, uh, in time. Uh, but I think eventually it will be, we are democracies. And what does seem to be a popular policy will be repeated by the next person. So that's, that's the short answer there. Uh, has America given up its superpower status? Certainly Mr. Trump is the first leader to acknowledge uh, that the U.S. does not want to be the team leader for the world. Uh, he's, in fact, looking for someone to just move into Afghanistan so he can uh, move out of it. Uh, and he's done that in so many other places. So, uh, But the truth is that there is an articulation, and then it takes a little time to happen. And things can change in between those two. Sharp questions. I have 12 people on the list. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Amit Tripathi and I'm a student. Uh, so the, you uh, did call up the elephant in the room that the public which has been, uh, whether it is the USA or the Britain or others, which have been driving people like Trump on the he heads of the democratic institutions, and that is that uh, they are f being a part of a rich country like USA or Britain, they have been facing pains in terms of uh, being able to uh, get a, a respectable income out of there. And that is uh, what has been lately driving the democratic uh, uh, policy direction per se in the entire European uh, continent sure. and others. So how do you think, and this is because of the uh, business gains that we have, we have made in the past decade or so, uh, the longest uh, prosperity that we have seen stably, and, and what that has led to is that why, when the business has gained, the people have paid their prices, uh, that by being the parts of USA, they, their share of the pie has shrunk. So what uh, is the policy uh, balance? Where will we reach uh, the direction we have moved in? What is the balance that we will achieve to balance both Understood. parts of the pie? Understood. Just pass the mic uh, my name is Narayanan. Uh, with the permission of the chat, two questions. Uh, the first question is deviating from the topic. Uh, by April or March 2020, the Democratic Party will have its uh, primaries to select the next presidential candidate or to person to oppose Trump. And as you had pointed out, Trump has done everything he said in his election, starting from moving uh, to Jerusalem, the embassy Absolutely. to Jerusalem. He has recorded 3.5% uh, GDP growth, which no economist believe. <coughs> what is the um, headline catching or tweet worthy the policy decision he's going to take in the next 15 years because he has to capture uh, electorate the Midwest, Midwest America is traditional Republican but he has to capture the East Coast and the West Coast he has to break into the democratic stronghold and what is that tweet and that is a theoretical question second question why are we so afraid or reserved in the chaos that Trump is unleashing. Isn't it good? Isn't it an opportunity for the whole world to raise? Because till 20, uh, 1917, America was a reserved country. It was the chaos of Kaiser Wilhelm and Adolf Hitler that it was on that foundation that Pax America was built. Had it not been for Kaiser Wilhelm and Adolf Hitler, America would still be the newfoundland yet to be discovered. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Basically, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I will sp step out of my brief because I'm, this is not my subject, uh, economics. But uh, the truth is that you're, I think you've really put your finger on something. Regardless of whether Mr. Trump comes to power, regardless of whether the United States turns the world on its head, um, there is a real problem with gro globalization. And I think we have to find a via media. It, it does not make sense that the smallest part of something comes from 10,000 kilometers away and you spend more money on shipping it than, you know, and, and that's what goes over to your consumer. It does not make sense that traditional handicrafts are dying around the world, that traditional ways of living are dying around the world because of globalization. And I think what you've picked up on is the backlash to that <clears throat> of people saying, my way of life has gone. And all I'm seeing is these, uh, these cheap plastic things taking over that way of life. It cannot be right. And if uh, somebody is making the world come together, as you said, uh, to perhaps come up with a, a, a different foundation for how to go forward, then Mr. Trump has had a good effect. Uh, uh, and you're quite right about that. But um, why should we be afraid of chaos? I don't think we need to be afraid of chaos, but you know, chaos does hurt people. 
Uh, the last two years of not knowing which way everyone is headed uh, has not been good for any of our businesses. And uh, worldwide trade is down. I think if you look at the figures, uh, 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 around the world trade is down. The GDPs may have increased in some countries, but uh, you are not seeing a better system right now. So uh, I do think that you know, chaos is, is all very well. It, uh, it is more democratic in a sense. It brings everyone down to the same level. But it, 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 it is hurt. And, it, and when people get hurt, it's always the people at the bottom of the rung. Thank you very much. Rajiv Bhatia, former ambassador, thanks a lot for a very lucid exposition. If we agree with you, it's not so interesting. So let me, <laughs> uh, let me present the dissenting view. Uh, I have reasons to believe that quite a few colleagues of mine in South Block uh, truly believe that Trump is good for India. You hinted at that. Why do they think so? Uh, you said yourself, he is tough on China, he is tough on Pakistan. He doesn't interfere in South Asia, leaving India to do what it pleases or not do anything at all. Uh, the room in Africa is open, either to China or India. He is uh, putting lots of cats in among the pigeons in Europe, which is wonderful because then everybody looks at China, India and others to lead. He has made life miserable for Russia. So Russians also look at India with some respect, which otherwise they would not want to do. Um, and as far as uh, the grievances of India are concerned, 26 January, he won't come. Well, he won't go, go anywhere, so what does it matter? Uh, he would not, um, uh, you know, give you H1 visa. I mean, India is being a little unfair. Why should we expect? Uh, it is America's right to give or not to give. And trade, frankly, this is not such a big issue between India and US as I think sometimes people make out. So, a foreign secretary, um, who is no longer foreign secretary now, said, you remember, let us not demonize Trump, let us analyze him. But what happens when the analysis actually leads you to believe that if the man is not a demon, at least he's fighting his own demons. So the question that I would like to put to you is, you know, here is a leader who uh, has specialized in losing friends and making enemies. Uh, not just in the world, but within his own establishment. People talked about, you know, AIDS coming and going. So I think, frankly, to argue that uh, this man is uh, a problem for the world, which I'm sure he is, we don't believe in his values, but to think that, you know, he would be a permanent effect and so on, frankly, uh, is really stretching it. You don't just know whether he would be back. You don't know what will happen after four years. I think we need not extrapolate and we need not, uh, you know, create pessimism all around. I think we should deal with him on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, keeping in mind that he's representing the most powerful nation in the world even today. So how do you really feel? Do you think that there is any uh, merit in the other view that let him do what he is doing? It's not all that bad for India. Thank you. Uh, my name is Donnie. Uh, can I? Okay. So, um, clearly, uh, have you factored in the midterms? That's one thing. Uh, because if you really look at the way Mr. Trump was elected, if you take away Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ohio, uh, he really didn't carry the rest of the country. Uh, was that? And and if you really look at the way um, the election swing has happened, mostly it's been in red states, right? So you made a point about him convincing. Uh, certain people and people changing their minds and moving over to his side. I'm really wondering if that's what we're really seeing on the ground because what seems to be happening is he has a core and many of the postulates on which that core is based are not real. They're shifting sands. I mean, like you said, they're illusions, right? So it seems like in a lot of places the illusions are, you know, there's, there's light on the illusions now and some people are moving back from him. And uh, if we were to extrapolate this with a greater blue state election, do we really see him coming back? And as a corollary to this, uh, in terms of lasting impact, while in a lot of these things there may not be, one place where there is likely to be definitely a lasting impact is the legal system. Because he's, uh, it's, it's a case, it's a, it's a case law based economy and country. And if you have a, a definitely permanent conservative majority on the Supreme Court, 
and a lot of the uh, judges down the road have been changed. You have interpretations of laws which will go, probably go uh, Mr. Trump's way, though uh, a lot of conservative judges are now beginning to give liberal judgments. Right. So that's my question. Do you think that lasting impact thing will survive these uh, issues? Um. Ambassador Bhatia, you're absolutely right. But I, I do have to ask the, the basic question, which is a bit of a contradiction here, which is that the greatest supporters of America's power are essentially advocating that America will be more, you know, will, will remain the same even as it retrenches. And my case would be that if you are seeing a situation where the US is retrenching from positions, uh, then I America may not be the most powerful country in the world. Is it or is it not in everyone's interest to see an America that has held the leadership of the world in a powerful position? I would actually posit yes. So in, in, a, in a strange way, I'm actually supporting uh, an idea of America uh, that doesn't seem to be shared by some of the people that, uh, that you had mentioned. Um, is Trump good for India? Yes. But if you are accepting, I mean, in, in, if, in the parameters that you said, doesn't interfere in South Asia, uh, is going after Pakistan, is, um, is getting tough with China and all the rest. Um, but in a sense, firstly, there is no predictability to that. Uh, tomorrow, he may be made uh, to believe that there is a certain value to dealing with Pakistan. He will do that. Uh, for all we know, he is uh, dealing with uh, uh, with Iran today simply so as to cut a deal tomorrow, which we will all pay for because we have come through all the upswings and the downswings of oil and, uh, and the unpredictability there. Um, and, uh, and finally, you may have a system which we've seen in the past with Obama when he went in to talk about the G2, where after having got the whole world you know, to be okay with him taking on China, he actually goes and cuts a deal there. So, and, and we've seen that in his tweets, that every few months we hear, you know, so-and-so is a great man, and so-and-so is a great friend, and it's all going well with so-and-so. Um, and, and we have to start uh, worrying. So in the large scheme of things, we may be lulled into a sense of complacency with the idea that uh, for today, it's okay. It's not bothering me. Um, but what happens when he creates those spaces what happens if he forges deals behind our back? Because let's be very clear, all the sanctions and the tariffs I referred to, we may have found a path through them today. When it comes to Iran, we still have to hear what happens with Katsa. But even though we have found that path through, it has been post-fact. Even a Japan and a South Korea did not actually get consulted when he took those decisions. So, uh, so we must understand very clearly that when he takes another decision, that too might, be, um, uh, that too might not be in our favor, and it will not be taken by consulting us. So I, I think that's, that's where we have to start worrying. Um, as far as you said, uh, have I analyzed the midterms? To be honest, I haven't, um, because I do believe that uh, the, and, you know, the presidential elections today, like all elections around the world, have a mechanism of their own. And I think that's when we will really start to see uh, what is the impact and whether Mr. Trump. I never said that Mr. Trump will be reelected. I said some of the ideas he has put out there will have given Americans a new idea uh, uh, of uh, where they see themselves, where they see trade issues, and all the rest of that. Um, how many Americans have been convinced that it's actually better not to have immigrants? I, I, you know, I, I, I would say that even a lot of Democrats uh, are actually taking harder line positions than we have seen in the past. So um, uh, so I, I would say that some of those ideas will remain regardless of whether he's reelected. May I just add one line since you raised this point and Rajiv Ambassador Bhatia also made this point about the permanence of the Trump effect. I think we will see a certain amount of that, for instance, in terms of the nominations to the Supreme Court. But then Mr. Trump is not the first president to pack the Supreme Court with his own choice. What is different, perhaps, is the quality of people who are being elevated, meaning that if you look at the last 40 years from FDR, or more than 40 years from FDR to Trump, there have been a number of instances where US presidents have chosen their own, shall we say, preferred candidates. But by and large, those candidates for the Supreme Court maintained a certain median, both in terms of their personal probity and otherwise. I think Mr. Trump is making that departure, and that could have a long-term effect, I would make the case, on the institution. 
in the United States and how that will play out, I think, you know, time will tell. Ma'am, you? Uh, hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Leshri and I've just graduated. I have this question uh, that you're saying US is creating problem for Pakistan, China and it doesn't, it don't have good relations with Russia. And now Pakistan is having good relations with like kind of agreements with Russia and Pakistan, oh sorry, China. So Pakistan, China and Russia, if they, three of them come together, will it create a problem for USA like in future or in like two, three years or something? Thank you. Uh, can I sit? My name is Deepak Dadlani. Um, there have been a lot, there's been talk even here also about the chaos theory. But I personally think what he is doing is more like a crazy man theory, you know. Um, there were three major milestones in the last 15, 20, at the turn of the century. We had, for America, one was 2001, 9-11. Then we had the Great Recession, 2008. But I think the biggest milestone is election of Mr. Trump. Um, because he's doing damage not only to America, but to many other parts of the world. We've seen also about the same time, a turn to the right-wing populism started with Russia, then uh, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, you have got Philippines. And of course, uh, my question really is, that uh, with all that is happening and the kind of terrible discourse on in America and some very regressive policies and ex exceptionalism already on the down downside in America, isn't it, isn't it in my view going to do a very great damage to this great country? Yeah. I'm Dr. Walia, a very quick question. Can you also spell out the main opportunities for Asia? Leave now. It's fine. If not, give me 10 minutes and we'll do it in a proper way. You can take these three. Um, very quickly, Russia, China, Pakistan coming together will be a problem for America. They'll also be a problem for India. Um, but I, I think, you know, everybody is working on this transactionalism at present. There are no, you know, uh, like dyed in the wool um, alliances that we're talking about. But, but what, you're, wh what you're referring to in the larger context is what I was trying to say, that don't just look at the embraces. Look at the spaces that are being left behind because there will be no vacuum. Somebody or the other will step in uh, and take care of a region that America is retrenching from. Um, uh, as far as the, yeah, it is called the madman theory, in fact. Uh, it's called Nixon's madman theory. Um, and uh, you're quite right that it does seem like a milestone from every account of what has happened. I was reading some of the internal, you know, I got segued off when I was preparing for this, and I started to read the Trump effect articles in the United States, and they begin with this, um, uh, with this uh, description of how uh, there was actually somebody who was a politician and the statements made by that politician, she has now resigned, she was the mayor, I think, of one of the cities, who actually said uh, to an African-American, why don't you go to Africa? And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 of course, we in India are no one to speak. We have a pretty uh, a desultory, uh, I mean, terrible discourse uh, in our country, too. But yes, I, as I said, the, the fact is that when the world looks to America, the values that they cherish, are, do seem to be in some kind of trouble uh, at the moment. But, you know, we'll all be here and, and analyze, trying to analyze it uh, some time from now. What are the opportunities? That actually should have been half of my talk, and unfortunately yeah. it wasn't. I think the opportunities, one is to, you know, just be the opportunistic kind of um, uh, uh, person and say, uh, yes, there are opportunities because as the U.S. takes on people, we should fill in to step into the breach. There is no question that when the U.S. began uh, to uh, its work, uh, its um, its problems with China and the trade war really blew up earlier this year, that India was looked at by many to be a kind of 
you know, to step into that, to become a manufacturing hub, to uh, ease business enough so that you could have a rash of these uh, fact uh, factories here. And I think the US ambassador, in fact, spoke about how there are so many in America who would like to see India becoming the alternative to China. Of course, it's early days yet. There are others in, in ASEAN, particularly, who would like to see India taking a leadership role of taking uh, positions and, and using the opportunities that are being left by the US in this region um, to, uh, to, for example, you know, forge ahead on the RCEP. Um, those haven't yet been realized. Uh, there are others who would like to see us do a little more patrolling, a little more uh, in, in the maritime sphere. Um, they haven't yet uh, come to a fruition. So you have, one is the opportunistic way, the second is the way where India takes a greater leadership role, um, whether it's in the conflict areas, whether it's in others. And the third is the one that I actually referred to in my speech, which is a more consensual um, sort of approach, which involves taking people on board with the issues, but it will require for people to be united on principle. That's not always easy. Um, when the current multilateral uh, fora are not allowing you to use uh, you know, to, to speak on, on principle purposes, um, then uh, it's harder to get people together on that idea. But I think Iran was a lost opportunity. Uh, here you have a system, a situation where America is definitely in the wrong. They have walked out of a deal that they signed on to. Uh, they are asking people to stop doing business with a country or else they are proposing to starve an entire population. And they are talking about sanctions uh, in a way that nobody quite understands how they're expected to work, and, and yet they are sending the international oil system into a tizzy. There are so many places where a united world could have taken on the United States, but we didn't. Yeah, just to add one more line, if I may, in terms of the Trump effect on American state and society. We have not discussed it, but clearly, I think what Mr. Trump has done to gender, some of his public statements you know, about women have been absolutely deplorable. It's been said as explicitly within the United States of America. But again, this is part of the phenomenon that we are discussing or trying to analyze, if we can put it that way, about what he has done you know, to discourse and what I might call as the benchmarks that earlier were not acceptable, now they're being lowered. And sometimes you wonder as to, you know, can it be lowered further? But that, I'll leave it aside because it's a complex Every day subject. we see the lower, yeah. and the lower I have just two students. I don't want to not recognize them. Is it okay by everyone Please, if yeah. I, sir, you, and then one more person at the back who asked. Was it you? Yeah, just two, and then we'll close. Please identify yourself. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm Abhishek. And my question is, uh, Defense Minister Nirmala Sitaraman said uh, in an interview, while she was asked about the sanctions on Iran and its effect in, on India, she said uh, uh, it's a U.S. sanction, not U.N. So uh, is India taking these sanctions lightly, right? Uh, on a way that uh, it believes that India is a market and uh, it can negotiate with the uh, U.S. bilaterally so that uh, it, it comes with certain benefits for India. Right? Pass the mic here. Quickly now. Twitter questions, come. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Ishan Jaipuriyar. I'm a law graduate. Uh, a quick question. So I just wanted to know if uh, India uh, could, is it legitimate to expect that India would stand uh, to benefit from a, uh, from a temporary chaotic world order, wherein we'll have a softer China, softer Russia for a transient period of time, and also a market to explore where uh, China is sort of on the back foot? My name is Keshav Chandra. I am from Delhi University. Uh, we stop uh, diplomat said uh, tell China uh, we want competition and so also uh, cooperation. So uh, both things happened same time uh, with China. Thank you. financial crisis uh, followed by uh, we can see all the wars which uh, America is fighting the trade imbalances they tried Obama and they didn't find any solution the public is now trying uh, Trump who is more of a businessman than playing the uh, common rules of diplomacy so if we look carefully there's not much of a difference being that Obama was also fighting those wars he was also maintaining those monarchies in uh, be it Egypt or Saudi Arabia 
and Trump has just withdrawn it to a limit. So the question is, the actual policy will not change much. The Trump is playing to the gallery, and then finally we will realize that there is a method in his madness, and will be benefit to the U.S. All right. Very popular. You want to go ahead? Thank you, ma'am, for an insightful talk. My question is that America, having played and having played its hand, uh, overplayed its hand earlier, uh, due to mainly due to dollarization of international trade. And now that Mr. Trump is unleashing uncertainty in the global trade order, are we in need for new global currency so that domestic policies like CATSA cannot uh, harm the global trade order? Okay, done. Cheers. Very nice. How much the questions, ma'am, all yours. No, and really, thank you for the questions. They've just uh, really had me on my toes. <laughs> uh, to begin with, uh, is, the, is India taking the sanctions uh, lightly? Uh, in a sense, you're quite right. Even External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj, when asked in, 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 on May 31st, I think, said uh, that India does not recognize unilateral sanctions. Yet everything we've done since then has kind of belied that because we allowed Nikki Haley and all the rest to come here and tell us, you know, cut down your oil. Uh, we allowed other uh, officials to go from here to discuss why Katsa should not be put on India. So we have not stuck... Uh, by the idea that uh, we don't care about uh, U.S. sanctions. We have tried to cut our own deal with them. I think, look, I mean, it, it does make sense that if you are looking at all of this chaos around and you're looking at all these major players all behaving in slightly irrational ways, it makes sense to just buy time. It makes sense to kick the can down the road, if you like, but not to forget that we have kicked the can down the road. Um, uh, would we stand to benefit from a nicer Russia, a nicer China in the, um, in, in the uh, short term? Uh, yes, we already are. We're, uh, we're doing trade negotiations with China, which we never thought were possible before. And China is opening new lines with us and uh, that sort of thing. Russia is being extremely nice to us. Remember, they reached out to India for the Sochi summit. Um, so there's no question that in the short term there are some uh, uh, gains to be had. Um, the question really is, uh, as I said just now, are we just kicking the can down the road and dealing with the situation today and saying, after elections, even we will see what happens after elections. Can there be competition and cooperation for the moment? For the moment. Um, uh, and it's not just in trade, right? The competition and cooperation will be in all kinds of spheres. Uh, are we able to think about cooperation with China in our neighborhood? Not yet. So. Uh, not always. Uh, I agree with you, sir. There's, uh, there's no question that uh, when you say that uh, the, tr uh, the Trump effect came because of uh, some of the policies that Mr. Obama had uh, that didn't give Americans a solution. Um, but I, 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 I would beg to defer when you say that, um, you know, that Trump's effect is just on the top is just a surface effect. Because it's having a very deep effect inside America. It's changing America's polity. It's having a deep effect on the international structure. It's having a deep effect in setting precedence when it comes to actions around the world. Uh, and it is having a deep effect. As I, uh, I keep saying this idea of, look at the spaces created. The space was created for Saudi Arabia to unilaterally blockade um, uh, Qatar, to unilaterally continuing this bombing of Yemen. Uh, and to, uni I mean, to, to fly in the Prime Minister of Lebanon, take away his cell phone, ask him to resign on your, uh, uh, you know, on your soil. And it wasn't until he went back and actually Lebanon had a president who said, I will not accept the resignation until he's back on my... And these are unilateral actions that are taken only because there is a lack of international order. So I would say, and I'm just using Saudi as one example, there are so many other examples. Um, that, that I would not take lightly what uh, the effect is. It's not a superficial effect on the world, and I'm not even getting into the domestic American situation. Um, uh, has uh, Trump overplayed, I think you asked, right? Is, uh, is the uncertainty going to, uh, was that your question? No. no. Sorry, your question. Oh, we need a new currency, sorry. Um, again, not my field exactly, but I do sense that uh, if there is more of this kind of uh, unilateral sanctions, we are going to see that emerge on its own. The, you know, remember, Europe has failed to provide a special purpose vehicle on this time around when it comes to Iran, but they haven't given up trying. 
And uh, if there are enough countries antagonized for long enough, you may actually see it happen. India has already built a certain small you know, alternative, if you like, um, from 2012 onwards. But you will see more of that. everyone for you know the quality of the discussion there are a number of points that actually do merit some kind of I would say reflection but I think we do not have the time but I do want to flag this point I made earlier about the two kinds of unilateralism that the world is now having to contend with till recently there was a sense that it was China's creeping assertiveness that was of relevance in Asia to India in particular but now we are also trying to understand what is being described as the Trump effect and the kind of unilateralism that Ms. Haider had spoken about, of which there are many examples. But I think the one that has the greatest urgency is what is happening in Iran and the way in which the Iran deal has been completely, I would say, jettisoned is going to have long-term implications. But as I said, this is one of many issues that are worthy of much more deeper reflection. I want to thank the audience. You know, it's getting on to 8.20. It's not always that the Gulmohar Hall and Habitat has this kind of, you know, shall we say, attention. And please note, not a phone rang, which I think is a remarkable indicator. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank our speaker, Ms. Heather. I think she's done a you know, brilliant job in terms of pulling together many strands and bringing it under the Trump effect. You know. And for our younger colleagues here, the students and those who aspirants from the civil services and some of our younger academics, as in the past, we often urge you saying that if you want to make a written contribution of about 500 to 700 words, we'd be happy to referee it and have it hoisted on the two websites. That is the Habitat. Sachin is here. You can identify yourself or Lakshmi if you identify yourself to her then Sachin is here, we'd be happy to make a thread of this. But, you know, we want something that is a little analytical and where you agree or do not agree because this is part of the effort at trying to keep the public discourse going. A final point, the text of Ms. Haider's lecture will be up on the website soon. She's going to just tweak it and give it to us and we'll make it format and put it up. We'll also have a YouTube link very soon. And the last aside is that when this went out on cyber, this morning I got an email from one of those, you know, I would say eagle-eyed cyber hawks who said, we have seen this particular thing, Ms. Suhasini Haider, Hindu, etc., etc. Is there a live stream? I promptly asked Habitat and we said we can't do it. So all I want to say is that this is a subject that is eliciting a considerable amount of interest. But more than that, Ms. Haider's, shall we say, profile, you know, commands enormous, shall we say, attention. And there was a point this evening when I was selling tickets in black <laughs> for payment in cigars and cognac. But on that note, thank you so much. We'll do this again in January. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, Habitat. And thank you, Lakshmi and all our colleagues. Thank you, Swasini. <laughs>